morning, Heights Church family. We know that we have so many people who are tuning in with us online, and we are so glad that you are joining us today. If this is your first time tuning in with us, on behalf of our pastors, Pastor Josh and Crystal Whitlow, and our entire team, welcome home. We would love to get to know you, send you a welcome email and a free gift in the mail. Make sure to fill out our online Connect card by texting CONNECT to 34681. And we know that we have some first-time guests with us in the building today, and if that's you, welcome. We are so glad that you're joining us today. We would love to meet you after one of our worship experience right outside at our new here tent. We have a free gift for you, so don't forget to stop by. If you are tuning in online and have kids right now, is a great time to get them set up with our incredible Heights Kids online worship experience. You can find our content by using our texting feature. Hey, we are so excited because next Sunday we're going to be having Promotion Sunday where we're going to be honoring our rising sixth graders and our graduating seniors. Our Heights Kids team has an incredible experience for our rising sixth graders as we celebrate them moving into Heights students. We will also be having, after the 11 o'clock experience, our HCS team outside with ice cream, ready to welcome our new students and their families. In addition, we are gonna be praying over our graduating seniors and giving them a free gift for honoring all of their accomplishments. Make sure to use our texting feature to sign up today. And don't forget, today we have Next Steps from 1 to 2.30. Childcare and lunch will be provided. Next Steps is our two-part course where you can discover heights and discover purpose. It's where you can become a member of our church family, get connected to our dream team, and start using your gifts to build God's house. And it's not too late to sign up. You can register right now using our texting feature. We are so excited for our summer small groups, and we have a quick video to show you what small groups are all about. So let's take a look. It's couches and porches and kitchen tables. It's stories shared and moments worth remembering. It's hoping and praying and taking chances. It's jokes and laughter and shoulders to cry on. It's questions and answers and I don't knows. It's knowing you don't have to figure it all out by yourself. It's messy and imperfect. It's giving and serving and growing better together. It's life, and we weren't meant to do it alone. Life is better together. It's for you. It's time to find your summer small group. We know that so many lives are changed through small groups, and this is just one way that we help lead people to experience the God who can change their life, and your generosity plays a role in that. Hey, if this is your first time joining us, we don't want anything from you. This experience was our gift to you. But if you call Heights home and you came prepared to get today, you can do so by the buckets in the back, our app, texting feature, or through our website. Heights Church family, we love you. Thank you so much for tuning into Heights News this morning. Right now, I have the absolute honor and privilege of introducing one of our best friends, Ali Wong. Allie, we love you and we are so thankful for you and our lives are better because of you. And we know that this house is better because of you and the way that you love and serve people. So church family, wherever you are, jump to your feet as we welcome Allie Law. morning and I'm so expectant for what God has in store for today. Come on, it's going to be a great day. Amen? Amen. Amen. You're in God's house. You're putting God first right at the beginning of your week. But before I go any further, I want to welcome all of our church online family. Come on, I'm so grateful for the gift of technology, but we can't wait to see you again in the building here soon. I got some family actually tuning in all the way from Boston, Massachusetts. And um, I got some family tuning in from Florida. So I love you guys. I'm so glad you guys are here worshiping with us this morning. Well, I am so honored, like I said, to be bringing God's word to you today. If you don't know me, my name is Ali Wong, like some of my best friends said, and I have the complete honor of being on staff here at Heights, and I'm kind of a two for one. I'm your communications director, and I help roll out communication here to make sure everything's super clear, and um, I create all those beautiful emails that a lot of you don't read. <laughs> Little jab there. 
Um, and I'm also, my other half is I have the opportunity to lead our guest experience teams and a lot of those friendly faces that you saw walking in this morning and waving and telling you welcome home, um, those are some of my people. So love them, so honored to serve alongside of them. But before I go any further and really dive into God's word today, I have a couple people that I want to honor. We're a house of honor here. And so I'm going to take a moment to, of course, honor our lead pastors, Pastor Josh and Crystal. I know that they're tuning in right now. And so I love you guys. I'm so honored that you would trust me to bring God's word today. And it's really because of their yes, them uprooting their family out of Northern Virginia and coming to Richmond and planning this church that we get to call Heights Church home. So we stand on their yes and their faithfulness today. So we love you guys. We honor you. And of course, I want to honor my family in the room today. Come on. Y'all. Such a sweet privilege to have my family in the room. I'm rolling deep today. I got two rows right here. Um, come on. I got a big family, and I am who I am because of my parents and my step-parents. So I love you guys. I'm so honored to stand on your shoulders. And really, there's one person in particular that I want to honor a little bit extra today, and that's actually my grandpa, my papa. And here, there's a picture right behind me. Isn't he handsome? He's so great. And Cashley, can you stand? Can you stand? Come on. I love you. Come on, that handsome man, my papa right there. I really honor him extra today because I stand on his shoulders in the faith today. It's really because of his yes. He grew up in a family that was broken and kind of riddled by alcoholism. But, a, but at a young age, my papa decided that his family wasn't going to look like that that his family was going to look different and that it was going to be rooted on God's word and God's faithfulness and God's redemption. And so I'm going to cry, especially because you're here today. Um, but I really honor him and I am who I am because of you and because of the trajectory that you have changed our family line. So I honor you. I hope to be just like you one day. Papa, come on, can you give it up? So good. So good. And if you guys are maybe tuning in online and you popped on today, or if you're joining us in the room for maybe the first time you haven't been with us these past couple weeks, I'll give you a little recap. We've been in this series called Sons and Daughters. Sons and Daughters, and it has been absolutely incredible. We've had the opportunity to hear from some sons and daughters of this house, Heights Church. Some of our staff have spoken over these past five weeks, and they have been incredible messages. Um, so if you've missed them, go back and watch them. They're super powerful, and each of us has gone through one of our Heights Church values. And our values really are just our culture of our church. It's who we are, and it's how we carry out our mission a day in and day out. So today I have the honor of speaking on the value, we are family. We are family, amen. And this is who we are right here because church isn't an organization that you join, but a family you need to belong to. We fight to make sure there's always room for more. Welcome home, welcome home. And that's really, Wow, I love this. You guys got caffeine. No joke. It's a really big difference between the 915 and the 11. Um, but welcome home. Welcome home. That's why we say welcome home. That's why it's plastered everywhere because we really believe that we're family here. And we hope that it's just not some cute phrase we, you hear. But we hope it's something you sense and you experience and that you belong to and that you take ownership in this house. And so a shameless plug. Join this family, make it official, go through next steps. We have it today from 1 to 2.30. Right after this experience, we're going to take care of everything you need, your food, your child. Um, we have child care provided, so stay after and join this church family. Make it official. Become a member of Heights Church. Um, and even if you don't, that's okay. If you decide this family, we think this family is pretty great. We're biased. Um, but if you don't join our church family, we encourage you, don't sit there too long. Go find another church that you can call home because we believe that the local church is actually the hope of the world. And we want you to get connected. And we want you to start using your gifts to build God's house and really have an impact in this world. So get connected to a church. That's one way that we cultivate this sense and this value of family is through Next Steps, getting you connected to our church and our amazing serve teams, our dream team, so you can start serving on Sunday morning. But another way, really the backbone of this value of family 
comes from something called small groups. And shocker, we've been talking about it for the past couple of weeks. Shameless plug, get in a group. Get in a group. You can do so today. Registration opens and groups will start in two weeks. So I encourage you to get in a group. And we have all different types of small groups here at Heights. We have groups that are catered towards age groups. We have really types of groups that are either centered on curriculum and they're centered maybe on a book of the Bible or on the grace of God. And then we have groups that are centered on an activity. Maybe you just get together once a week and you play flag football. And if you're like me, I'm going to be joining a group that's centered around food in Jesus' name. Um, come on, I love some good food. I love some good food. So we have all different types of group. And I'm going to be super transparent that those activities or those curriculums are really just a hook. They're a hook, and we hope that it would grab your attention, you would sign up for one. But really our hope and our prayer is that coming out of that small group, you would find some life-giving relationships. And that you would really find a place of community and that you would cultivate this sense of family. We know that you, a couple months after your group ends, you'll probably, you're going to forget that curriculum or you might forget about that coffee date or whatever your group was surrounded on. But we know that you're not going to forget a friendship. We know that that friendship could carry you through, could be the one thing that keeps you connected to this church and to God's word. So that's our prayer for small groups. We're not just going to gather together on Sundays, but we're really going to do life together in community and in relationship with each other. Amen. Amen. So the title of my message today, centered around family, is called We Need Each Other. We need each other. Amen. Well, church family, let me pray for you, and then we're going to dive into God's word today. Lord God, I thank you so much. For this room full of people, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for giving me this opportunity to bring your word today, God. And I just pray, Lord, that you would soften hearts in this room. God, that you would lead all of us, even if we've been following Jesus for years, or maybe if we're going to take a step into relationship with you today, God, we pray that you would lead all of us to take a step closer to you and closer to your people, Lord Jesus. We need you today. Fill me with your spirit, Lord. May they not be my words, but yours. We need you in this place. We trust you, God. It's an awesome and powerful name of Jesus that I pray. Amen and amen. Well, we need each other. We need family to come alongside us. And as I was thinking about you guys this week and praying for you and what I would say, I was really reflecting on this past year and COVID and all the impact that it's had in my life and in your life and in our church and our community in America. And really, in the midst of a crisis or a pandemic, I think we can all agree on something that we've learned, and it's that we need each other. Yeah. That in the midst of a hard spot, we don't need to be alone, but we need to be in community, and we need to yeah. have each other alongside of us. And it's really necessary to do life well. Yeah. But something interesting with this pandemic is that we, have, we haven't had the opportunity to come together a lot. Words like isolation and quarantine and remaining socially distanced from each other have become a part of our world and our language and our vocabulary, right? And something that I think is tragic, it hasn't even affected, it's not just affected us physically, but it's really affected us emotionally in the way that we carry ourselves. And of course, we have needed to do these things out of safety and precaution. And please hear me, we honor and respect our local and national authorities. Um, and we take COVID very seriously, but we, we know that the effects of it aren't just physical. We know that they've done something in us. And really this vocabulary, I think, has seeped into our hearts. And it's really led us to a place where we could convince ourselves that we actually don't need each other. That I'm kind of lonely and the more that I'm alone, the more I can convince myself that I don't need each I, we don't need each other that I don't need anyone to help me, that I'm doing just fine on my own, just fine on my own. And I'm not naive to think as we regulations start to shift and change as we can meet in rooms full of people again, but I know I've experienced it myself. You can be in a room full of people, but you can still be lonely. You can still be physically with someone, but you can still feel alone and isolated. And the truth is, is that it's a lot easier to stay in that place of loneliness and isolation because relationships are hard and they're messy and they take work and intentionality. And when you take two broken people and put them together, it's hard work. And the thing about relationships is that when you step into a relationship or a friendship, 
you have to be vulnerable and you have to start connecting and you might actually have to start addressing those hardships and the things you're struggling with or walking through, right? And it's hard. And so I was thinking about this and so I was doing a little research this week and I was thinking to myself, you know, am I, have I just felt this way throughout this past year? Have I fallen into places of loneliness from time to time? Is this just my friend group or is this something that's bigger? It is. I found an article actually from Harvard. They're a lot smarter than I am, so I trust their word. And an article came out fall of this past year, and it was titled Loneliness in America. And two statistics really stuck out to me. In the first one, it says around 40% reported feeling lonely frequently or all the time. Church, that's two out of five people. You know, I talk to a lot of people on Sunday mornings usually, and if this is true, if around two out of five people are, would say that they feel frequently or lonely all the time. This broke my heart, it really did, and what's even worse is it says this, around 61% of young people aged 18 to 25 reported miserable degrees of loneliness. And this was really hard for me to hear because this is my age group. And a lot of people that I do life with and in community with and in relationship with, they're in this age group. So if this is true, a lot of my friends would probably say that they're actually miserably lonely. And this article went on to say that the effects of loneliness are actually pretty serious. They're pretty actually deathly. It says pretty much what I gathered, everything bad is up. Depression and anxiety is up. Mental illness is up. Heart disease is up. Addiction is up. Abuse is up. Sexual, emotional, physical abuse, it's up. And early death is up. A lot of these things have caused people to feel so isolated and alone that they would actually take their life in suicide. Or maybe a lot of these things like abuse and addiction that have led them to a place where they felt like they didn't have any other option. Are you glad that you came to church today? You maybe probably convinced yourself. I convinced myself after reading this article, you know, like, wow, I'm pretty lonely. I, I wouldn't feel lonely before, but after this article, I'm feeling pretty alone and pretty hopeless. But don't worry, there's hope in this message. We're not going to stay here very long. But I just want to paint a picture of this is the reality of a lot of our lives and a lot of the people that we walk day in and day out with. This is what they're walking through. But I was thinking that as I was reading this and getting super down, um, that God really didn't design us for loneliness. He didn't design us for isolation, but he actually designed us for relationship with each other. You know, the first problem in the Bible wasn't actually sin, it was solitude. In Genesis 2, 18, right after he made everything we see and love and know in this world, he said, the Lord God said this, it is not good for man to be alone. And then he made a companion for man so that he wouldn't have to be alone. God never designed us to be lonely or alone, but he actually designed us for relationships. And from Genesis all the way to the New Testament where we're going to be studying and reading from today in John, it paints a picture in the scriptures of how we were made for relationships. Not only relationship with God, but relationship with each other and how we need relationships. And we're actually going to pull from a story in John chapter 13. That's where we're going to start today. And we're going to walk through some conversations that Jesus had with his disciples right before he was taken to be crucified and arrested. And as I was reading and studying, I was thinking, you know, if these are the last things that Jesus said to his closest friends and colleagues, they're things that we should probably pay attention to. And he really states a case to them of how much we need each other. So we're going to pick up there at the Passover table where Jesus is sitting with his disciples. And, you know, at this time in culture, we're going to read about how Jesus starts washing the disciples' feet. And at this time in culture and history, this was pretty customary if you were having a gathering that there would be someone present to start washing people's feet. It's really like a welcome home gesture. And so Jesus starts to wash one of the disciples' feet, Peter. And immediately as he's doing this, Peter says, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm good. I will pass. And you know, as I was reading, I was ragging on Peter because I'm going to out myself here. I'm a super girly girl, and I love having my feet done. I love my toenails painted. I would love to have a pedicure all the time. You know, I run sometimes, so sometimes my feet don't look the best, kind of calloused and jacked up. And if my toenails aren't painted, 
And if the Savior of the world came when my feet were in this state and started to wash my feet, I would say the same thing as Peter. You better back up. <laughs> and so, yes, this is where we pick up. And, you know, we think we laugh and it's silly. And I was joking as I was studying by myself. Um, but I think a lot of us truly do this in our own lives. You know, we let Jesus into the pretty parts in our life. God, you can wash my hands. Maybe you can wash this little problem. But when you start getting into the crevices and the dark places of my life that my shoes can cover up, we say, no, 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 that's too close for me. It's a little too close for comfort. And the truth is today that we need Jesus to get into those spaces in our lives, but we also need people to get into those spaces in our lives. And so that's where we're going to pick up five principles from God's word today. And the first one is this. I need people who will care for me. I need people who will care for me. In John 13, 12 through 15, you can read with me on the big Bible on the screen. It says, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, Jesus asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightfully so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. We need people who are going to care for us. We see Jesus he, here, he cares for the disciples, and then he commissions them to go and care for other people. Do exactly what I have done to you to other people. And what I gathered from this scripture is that we need to be caregivers, but we also need to be care receivers. Amen? We need to be care receivers. And, you know, like I said, I would probably stiff arm Jesus if I were in the place of Peter. But honestly, I do this with a lot of people. It's not, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm a work in progress, y'all. And I love to care for people. I'll pour out my heart for them. I'll put them first. But the minute that they turn around and try and care for me, I'll stiff arm them. And that's just my nature. I'm like, I'd rather do it myself. You don't know what you're doing. I'm, I can be pretty prideful at times. And, you know, it reminded me of something that happened to me here recently. You know, I started dating someone in January that actually goes to this church. She's right here in the front row. Um, come on. <laughs> Sheesh. Um, but, yes, single girls, shameless plug. If you are looking for someone to date, this is a really great place to meet someone. You know, befriend them, start serving with them, start checking them out. You know, it's a great place to pair up with someone. So keep sticking around on my single girls. Don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. Super practical. I'm trying to help you all today. Anna, I see you. She's blushing. She is blushing right on the front row. Come on, we're family here. We're family here. You can laugh in God's house. Um, but as I said, I started dating someone, Michael, here recently. And he came up to me one day at the office. He said, hey, Allie, I want to buy you an outfit for Easter. And my immediate response was, no. <laughs> I said, no, you don't need to do that. I'm trying to save money. I already have an outfit. Don't, you don't need to do that. And he's like, no, no, you don't understand. I'm going to pay for you. I'm going to pay for the outfit, whatever you want. And I said, no, I'm good. <laughs> I'm a work in progress, like I said. I'm a little stubborn at times. And so he kept pressing me, and he was like, you know what, fine. Let me just take you to the mall, and you can look around. And if you find something great, and if not, no pressure. It's okay. We just get to spend time together. And I was like, okay, when you word it like that, I'll say yes. And so I ended up going with him, and I found it a cute little outfit, and he bought it for me. And all as well. And I know this sounds silly, but like I said, how many times do we do this in our own lives? That we'll pour out care and we'll pour out care and we'll meet everyone's need. We'll drop everything in our life to meet a need. But the minute that they turn around and ask us, hey, how are you doing? How can I care for you? That we say, no, thank you. We need to learn how to be caregivers and care receivers. Come on, we need people to care for us. In Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10, it says this, two people are better than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help them. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. They're in real trouble. Come on, we need some people that are going to get around us and care for us. Don't be left alone. Have some people that will let, let them care for you. Come on, our pastors are incredible people. They're incredibly gifted, but I hate to break it to you today. They are not God. They cannot be omniscient and omnipresent. They can't be everywhere all at once and know 
hundred people in our church's care needs. They can't read your mind. But our pastors are so wise and they've equipped an incredible group of people called small group leaders. And these people are actually trained to come around you and care for you on your darkest days. And rally your small group around you and really meet needs that you have in your life. So when you join a small group, this is what I want you to do. I want your, you to keep your small group leaders informed on what you need, what your care needs are. Keep them informed. Allow them to come alongside you and care for you. So I not only need people that will care for me, I need people who are going to encourage me. I need people who are going to encourage me. Come on, sometimes you just wake up and it's not your best day. You wake up in a funk. Come on, life gets you down. I know I've been there. Sometimes you just need to add a girl. Come on. Come on, a little pat on the back. You're going to be all right. You're going to live and not die in Jesus' name. Come on, in John 14, 1, it says this. Jesus is speaking. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. Trust in me. And if you actually read further in this chapter, John goes on to describe that Jesus talks about heaven and how there's actually many rooms for us in heaven. There's no shortage of space for us in heaven. And he's saying, Allie, come on, get your head up, lift your eyes above what you're walking through and what you can see in front of you. And just think about heaven for one moment, that your best days are actually ahead of you. They're not behind you. And I think we all need to be reminded of that sometimes. Hey, you're going to be okay. Lift your eyes up. You're going to be all right, we just need some people to encourage us. You know, and the word encourage actually means to lift the spirits of. Come on, does anybody need that today? I just need my spirits lifted. I need to be encouraged. In Hebrews 3.13, it says it like this, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You know, just this week, super practically, some of my close friends knew I'd have the opportunity to speak, and I was getting really nervous. I was getting really insecure, and then they would just, a couple of my friends text me, hey, Allie, you're going to do great this weekend. Hey, Allie, I'm praying for you. I'm so proud of you. And you know, if I didn't believe it then, I believed it after that text. And sometimes it only takes a little text of encouragement to kind of boost your mood and really lift you up. And so get some people around you, and when you're in small groups in just two weeks, exchange phone numbers, and encourage each other weekly. Super practical, you guys, nothing crazy. And come on, single guys, this could be your in. Of that cute girl in your small group, come on, we're family here, this could be it. Just exchange a phone number, start encouraging her, see what happens. <laughs> hey, it worked for me. I need people that will not only encourage me, but I need people that are gonna partner with me. Partner with me. Come on, a wise theologian said it takes the teamwork to make the dream work. Come on, that's why we call it the dream team. And this is what Jesus says in John 15, verses 4 through 5. Remain in me, and I also will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the true vine, Jesus says. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I don't know about you, but I'm trying to bear much fruit in my life. And Jesus is encouraging us today that we need to stay connected to him. We need to stay connected to the vine to bear much fruit. But I love in this verse, I've never realized this, it says branches. That's plural. That means that it's us. We're all connected to Jesus to find life and to really make a difference. We're going to bear much fruit. But when we also do it all together, there is much fruit. Amen. We need a partner with each other. And something that I think about when the power of partnering together is I think about the finances of this church. Really the tithes and the offerings of this church. I'm going to be honest, my tithe alone can't do that much. But when all of us tithe together, we can actually have eternal impact and make a huge stamp in eternity. Come on, it's powerful what can happen when a, a couple of people come together and just say yes to Jesus and partner together in what he wants to do. You know what we get to part of when all of us come together in this way is we can actually serve and meet needs in our city. 
We can actually send missionaries out to change the world. We can plant churches all throughout America. This is what we get to be a part of through the finances of this church. We get to feed children in Kenya and Peru and the Philippines. And we not just meet a physical need of food, but we get to change communities and generations in the name of Jesus. Come on, that's something to be excited about. Come on, just, just a church full of people that say, yes, God, I'm going to put you first in my finances. And something that's really special that our church gets to be a part of by just saying yes is RVA week. And this is actually three days that we dedicate every single summer that we're just going to say yes to the needs in our city. That we're going to show up and we're going to serve the heck out of our city in hopes of meeting some physical needs that we can meet a spiritual need in someone's life. You know, as we're exchanging that free lunch, you know, Jesus loves you so much. Do you, do you want to start a relationship with him? We have that opportunity when we meet physical needs. So make it a priority to be here for RVA Week. It's August 12th through 14th. Come on, shameless plug. Communications director, what do you want me to do? I'm just trying to get it in there any way I can. In Ephesians 2.10, it says this, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us in advance to do. You know, whether it's tithing or whether it's serving, when each of us do a little bit together, we actually do a lot. When we partner together, it makes a difference. So when you're in your small group, I want you to do a serve project together as a small group. And don't wait until RVA week. It's okay if you just see a need in our community and your small group says, hey, we're going to go fix that porch together. Hey, we're going to go feed that family. I see that they're struggling. So it don't, you don't have to wait until RVA week. As soon as your small group gets together, make a difference together and partner with each other to meet the needs in this city. I not only need people that are going to partner with me, I need people who are going to protect me. Protect me. Guys, I'm not perfect. You probably have learned that from today and gathered that from all my things today. Um, but I have a lot of places of weakness and vulnerability. And I'm so grateful for the friends in my life that see those things and they don't shame me for those things, but they come close and they protect those spaces in my life. And I'm so grateful for that. In John 16, one, Jesus says it like this, all of this I have told you so that you don't go astray. So you don't go astray. And astray simply means off the right path, route or course. Jesus is telling the disciples all these things so that they don't fall off course. And we need Jesus to stay on course, but you know what we also need is people. We need people to be close enough to us where they can see when we're starting to drift off course and say, hey friend, I love you so much, but we need to come back over here. We need people to protect us. And Ecclesiastes, it says it like this in chapter 4, verse 12. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three, even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. It's not easily broken. We need people to actually get close enough to us to see those places, to protect us. And a way that we can protect each other is by asking each other some hard questions. You actually need to have people close enough where they can ask you those hard questions. And I thought of some practical questions, friends, that I've been asked and that I've also asked other people. I've been on both sides of this coffee date, and it, sometimes it can get a little uncomfy. We're going to walk through them together. It's going to get real quiet in here. Y'all ready? <laughs> so here's some practical questions that you could ask. How are you taking time to rest and take care of yourself? Are you really honoring the Lord with your time? Are you taking a Sabbath as he commanded? How's your marriage and your family? Are you really prioritizing God and then your family? That should come right under your relationship with the Lord. Have you put yourself in a compromising situation this week? How's your finances? Have you done anything recently that maybe has lacked financial integrity? How's your job? How you doing? How is your purity? What are you consuming? What are you watching? What are you listening to? Who are you spending time with? All my single girls and dating, this one's important. I'm right here. This one is important. Accountability is very important for your purity. And how is this? How has your time with the Lord been? How, 
How's your quality time with the Lord been? Have you been prioritizing your relationship with him, spending time in his word and in prayer and in his presence worshiping? And not just here on Sundays, at home. Are you putting him first in your life? Please, church family, hear me today. Don't go around asking these questions after church. (laughs) Have some social awareness, please. Do not ask these questions to just anyone. You better have some relational equity with someone to really sit on either sides of this table and ask some hard questions. Because we we ask these questions, again, not out of judgment. We ask them out of a deep sense of love and protection for that other person and really to call them out into a higher standard and so that they're going to stay on course for the long haul. Amen? Amen. Come on. So we're going to ask each other some hard questions. We say it here at Heights that you're only as sick as your secrets. Please don't tell everyone these things and don't ask everyone these questions, but you better have someone in your life who you're talking about these things with. Amen? So very practically, when you're in a small group, you better ask each other some hard questions. Some hard questions. And lastly, leads me to my final point. I need people that will pray for me. I need people that will pray for me. Oh, I'm a work in progress. I need some prayer in my life. And it, Jesus says it like this in John 17 verses 1 and 9. As Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and he prayed. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but those you have given me. You know, Jesus came. He loved the world. He came out of heaven to save the world. But in this moment, he's not talking about the world. He's talking about his disciples. He's talking about those that are closest to him that God truly entrusted Jesus to care for. So he's covering them in prayer. And I think Jesus knows something very powerful here that if the disciples are covered in prayer and they're healthy, guess what? The church is going to be covered in prayer and healthy. And that's what we want. You know, shame on us if we're out there changing the world as a church, but we're not healthy. And we're not well, and we're not filled up with the Spirit of God, then everything we're pouring out is just going to be empty and hopeless. So we better make sure we're healthy and covered in prayer. You know, it's actually a very intentional piece um, that we train our small group leaders every single day to pray for you by name. We train them to pray for you by name. And we also work it into every small group that we would take prayer requests every single week. And we mean it. We're not just taking them and we're never going to do it. We actually pray for you. And it's funny. I lead a group of high school girls. And every time we take prayer requests, it's crickets. Hey, girls, how can I pray for you? Nothing. So I always joke with them. I'm like, you perfect? Is your life perfect? (laughs) Really nothing you need prayer for at all? And then one of them comes up and says, I have an SOL coming up. (laughs) The sweetest thing. The sweetest thing. I got some of my small group girls in the room. All of them are blushing. And, but it's, it's funny. As soon as one person gets up and says, you know, I need prayer, then all of them start sharing their prayer requests. There's really power when you step out. So don't let the, your pride get the best of you. Really step out. You know, in James it says that God opposes the proud, but he comes close and he gives a grace to the humble. And so when we share our prayer requests, don't be prideful, but really humble yourselves and allow God to move in that moment. We need people that will pray for us. So when you're in a small group in just a couple of weeks, I want you to share your prayer requests weekly and cover each other in prayer. Amen. You know what's funny about prayer is when we ask someone for prayer, they get the opportunity to pray for us, but they also get the opportunity to connect with God for themselves. Some of my best prayers have started because I started praying for someone else. And then what happens? I start praying for the things in my life, in my weak spots. And it's actually changed the trajectory of the relationship that I have with the Lord. So don't miss an opportunity. It's a win-win. Share your prayer requests and allow someone to get connected to the Lord themselves. It could change their life. Amen. So we need each other. I think we can gather that from today. We need family around us. We need each other. And we not only need people that will encourage us, care for us, partner with us, protect us, and pray for us. We need each other. Amen. Amen. We are family. And I hope you hear all these things today when when groups start in just a couple of weeks. And I know you guys are going to sign up. Maybe some of you already have. Um, But don't forget all these action steps that we walk through. Don't just see a need and then don't do anything about it. No, it takes initiative to have some life-giving relationships and friendships. 
please sign up for a group and take the initiative. It takes work to have life-giving relationships. It's not going to fall in your lap like that Instacart order, I promise. It takes some work and initiative. you got to step out and actually put yourself out there and say, hey, friend, do you want to grab coffee? Hey, could I have your number? Hey, could you pray for me? How can I pray for you? How are you doing? How's your finances? All of these things take initiative. They take initiative. And they not only take initiative, but they take some commitment. Come on, the relationships that you love and treasure in your life, they've taken commitment. That you wouldn't just sign up for a group, but that you would actually follow through and show up. And not just be a body there, but that you would show up and be present and get the most out of it. When you're going to get out of it what you put into it. So you got to show up, you got to take initiative and build some community. Amen? Amen? And maybe you're hearing all these things today. And you're like, okay, Ali, I hear you. I'm pretty lonely. Thanks for calling me out. You know, I need some people to really come around me. All those, all those types of people, I want some of that in my life. I'll even sign up for a group today. You've really convinced me. I'll sign up for a group today. But the reality is, communications director, groups don't start for two weeks. And I needed groups yesterday. And I needed that life-giving relationships yesterday. And I'm lonely right now. And if you hear nothing else from this message today, I hope that you would hear that you're not alone. That you are not alone. That God sees you. That God knows you. And he wants to meet you in that place of loneliness today. You know, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is Psalm. Oh, guys, I I didn't even look at my notes. I didn't even realize. (laughs) Is Psalm 68.6. And it says this. That God sets the lonely in families. You know, this verse means so much to me because I really experienced the power of this verse. I really seen God take me out of a lonely spot and set me into the family of God. And this just reminds me of a time in my life that it really was marked by a year of loneliness. And it was in 2018 I actually had just moved back from JMU. Come on, do I have any Dukes in the house today? (laughs) Come on, go Dukes. I got a couple. We're rolling deep. Um, But I moved back from Harrisonburg. I was there for four years at college, and I moved back to the city of Richmond. And I was looking for friends and community, but it was just a year that was really hard. And I needed community. I felt so lonely and isolated because I started as a new grad, I jumped right into a full-time nursing job in the hospital. And if you know anything as a new grad at the hospital, you get the worst shifts and you get kind of like last picks on the totem pole. And every two weeks I was switching between day shift and night shift and day shift. And my shifts were all over the place. I worked weekends and holidays and all over. It just, I didn't have a consistent Monday through Friday schedule. That wasn't my story. And I just want to take a moment to honor all of our frontline workers, all of our nurses and our doctors. And I know that extends, I know that extends into law enforcement. A lot of people that do shift work and night shift, this, maybe you could relate to this story. Maybe you felt this way too. Um, But I was in that place and because I didn't have a consistent schedule, it was really hard for me to, to make connection with people. You know, I couldn't just ask someone, hey, I'm free at 2 a.m. on Tuesday if you want to grab coffee. I'm trying to stay up for night shift. You know, that's not super practical. People would look at me like I was crazy. And so I just got into this place where I was really lonely. And it got to the point where to and from work, um, I would cry almost every day. My poor mama was on the other end of those phone calls up and down Poet Parkway. And it was really a lonely spot. But, you know, even though my circumstance didn't change for a while, there was one thing that carried me through that season, and it was my relationship with God. You know, no one else at 3 a.m. when I was on my knees praying, no one saw me, no one heard me, no one saw the tears that I was crying, but God came close to me, and he really lifted me out of that place of loneliness and set my feet on a rock like we were talking about this morning and singing about. He really placed me in a family, and he came close to me. Maybe you're in this room today and you're feeling that you know he really and in that place of loneliness he came close to me and he whispered to me that he would be the one to encourage me 
that he would be the one to care for me, that he would be the one to partner with me, that he would be the one to protect me, that he would be the one that was gonna pray for me and sing songs over me time and time again, that he was gonna meet me in that dark place of loneliness. So if you're feeling lonely today, listen to me, God can meet you in that place and he can fill that void that you are feeling and he wants to come close to you if you're feeling far from him today. So I would love to pray for you. If you would go ahead and bow your head and close your eyes. And I believe that God really wants to restore some people that I said, you know, that I was in that place, that lonely place, that dark place. Maybe you feel far away from God today, but I believe with all my heart and I can say it with confidence that he wants to restore you that he wants to set you in the most beautiful family and that's the family of God. We need each other, yes, but more than anything else, we need a relationship and closeness with Jesus. You don't need a religion, you don't need a church membership, you need to be in a relationship with Jesus. And how you really do that, how you come into a relationship with him is by first dealing with your sin. You know, we are far from God because of the state that we're in with our sin. But Jesus saw that and it broke his heart and he stepped out of heaven into earth so that he could close that gap and he could bring you and God back together. Jesus said that the two will become one in Ephesians and Jesus did that. He did all of that to make us close and to bring us back in union and communion with him. And you may be asking yourself, well, Allie, how do I get rid of my sin? How do I start a relationship with Jesus? Just two simple steps. Ask God to forgive you and give him your life. Give him your life. And I promise he's going to remove every barrier that sin tried to divide. Please hear me today that Jesus came to bring you close. So if that's you, if that's you today and you say, Allie, I'm lonely. I want what you're talking about. I want a relationship with God. I want you to be bold, and on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand so that I know who I'm praying with today, and I can really speak a word over you. So if that's you, on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Come on, say, Allie, that's me. I'm feeling lonely. I'm feeling alone. I feel isolated. I feel far from God. I want something fresh, and I want something new, and I want that. I don't want my sin to take hold of me anymore. No, I want a fresh relationship and closeness with my God. I want to be set in the most beautiful family, and that's the family of God. Amen. And if that's you, if you raised your hand or if you didn't, I want you to say this all together as a church family right now. Say, God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to pay for my sins. God, I'm far from you, but I want to be close. Say, Jesus, forgive me. Be my Lord and be my God. I believe that you are the son of God. I believe you came and lived a perfect life. I believe you died and rose again. And today, I put my faith in you. And today, I start a relationship with you. And everyone, would you open your hands up this morning and say, Jesus, I surrender. I surrender. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Come on, church. Let's stand to our feet and thank God for this amazing word that he brought this morning. Lord, we love you. Allie, we love you so much. So thankful for you and for just the impact that you have in this house on my family personally. You are such a gift. Um, We are so thankful for each and every person who just said yes to Jesus. So whether you are joining us online or you are here in the house, church, I want you to put your hands together and celebrate all the lives that are forever new today in Jesus. Lord, we love you. God is working. We are so thankful. 
If you made a decision to follow Jesus today and you're joining us online, we would love to know about it. If you will text CONNECT to 34681, we would love to send you a book called Fresh Start. And if you are here in the room, we would love to put that book in your hand out in the lobby at our Connections booth. Just see us after this experience. Fresh Start is simply a resource that we give you to help you in this new journey with Jesus. This is a new New life starting today. Things that were dead are no longer dead. And we want to come alongside you as your church family and support you in this decision. So would you let us know about that? I just want to take a second and kind of shift the way that we normally close out our experience time together. I want to remind you if you're visiting us for the first time today, we're not asking anything from you. We are so incredibly honored that you're here with us today. We know that there are so many places that you can be. And so your decision to be here in God's house with us this morning is something that we are so thankful for. But for those of us who call Heights home, I feel like God has given me something to share with you this morning. We've been sharing stories for a little while, and I was praying over how to close out this time together. And I felt like the Holy Spirit really whispered to me and said, Brittany, there's some people that are in the room this morning that I'm calling to some places that they can't see the provision for. I'm calling them out into some places and they don't know how I'm going to make the way. And so I have a personal story. If it's okay, I'd like to share it with you this morning. I don't know if I'm the only one, but I experienced a pretty unordinary 2020. Anybody else in the house have a pretty unordinary 2020? Well, at the end of 2019, my husband and I brought our son Easton home through adoption. So we went out in 2019 with a bang, and it was the most incredible thing. But we learned a couple things through that experience. The first thing was that private adoption is very expensive. It is very expensive. The second thing we learned is that you have to pay, pay the entire amount up front before you can take your child home. And so we were sitting in the hospital with Easton. I'm going to let y'all in on how it went down. We had four credit cards, and we said, can you swipe this one? And now that one's Max, can you swipe this one? And I'd like for you to swipe this one, and there's just one more. If you could also swipe this one, and this is how we're going to take that baby home. And let me tell you guys, we held that baby tight, and we held our heads up, and we walked out of that hospital with our son. And we had a plan. Does anybody else ever have a plan for how you're going to get something done? We knew God had called us through it or to it, but we, we had a plan for how we were going to take care of that debt. At the time, I was working in the corporate world, and we knew that we had budgeted all of my income to pay our adoption loans every single month. That was how we were going to get it done. And then in addition to that, we had made a plan that we were going to host a golf tournament. Well, in 2020, our plan changed. Our country shut down, and I lost my job, like many of you, due to COVID-19. All of the extra income that we had allocated for those loan payments was gone in a single day. A few weeks after that, the golf club called us and said, guys, I'm so sorry, but we're not actually going to be hosting any golf tournaments in 2020. Our entire plan the plan that we had hedged all of our bets on was completely demolished in a day. And from the outside, it may have seemed like everything was falling apart. But I'm just here to tell you today, because I'm standing on the other side of it, that God was actually putting it all together. See, we spent months and months leading up to our adoption praying for God to make a way, for God to provide the resources. And not only did he make a way, but he actually fortified and he strengthened our faith. And my husband and I learned that that is the greatest resource that we could ever have. I'm telling you, we started off our marriage, we made the commitment that we were going to give the first 10% of our income to God. It was going to be our tithe, every single paycheck. And this was a time in our life that our circumstances made us feel a little bit uncomfortable doing that. But we knew that God was going to bring us through it. And at the end of 2020, we paid every single adoption loan in full. No golf tournament, no job. 
but God made a way. And not only did he make a financial way for us, God provided something for us that we didn't even know to pray for. Listen, I have a little boy that one day, one day might look at me and say, Mama, why is this my story? Why is this my story? Well, I can tell you that because of God moving and making a way, I can look at Easton and say, baby, I don't know why this is your story, but I know that God is writing your story and that he chose me to be your mama and he chose your daddy to be your daddy and he moved mountains to bring you into our family. And I'm here to tell you today, church, that what he did in my life, he wants to do for you too. So I'd like to end our time together with you stretching out your hands and I want you to reach up to God and I want you to think about those things that you're believing him for because he is a way maker and a miracle worker and the miracle he did in my life is just one of many all in this house. Let's pray and ask God to bless what we bring. Father God, we love you. Lord, we are so thankful, God, that every day you're working miracles on our behalf, God, and we can trust you for everything, even the things, God, that we can't see. We know you're in it, and we know you're moving and you're working. Now take what we give and bless it. Multiply it, oh God, and make it more in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We love you, church family.